There must be some kind of way out of here Say the joker to the thief There's too much confusion I can't get no relief This knowledge that you think we have that we've pretty much figured out exactly what the universe is doing and exactly what life is doing I think uh, scientists often will make these exaggerated claims about the knowledge that they have because science is now wedded to industry. So, you know, the more radical and astonishing that scientists' claims are, the more research money they're going to get. So we can't always take the scientists for their word when they say, oh, we understand life down to the smallest molecule. Because Darwin's theory, for example, doesn't account for the origin of life. It doesn't account for the apparent direction of evolution towards complexity. And genetic, uh, this genetic theory that we're all just DNA trying to replicate itself, that's, uh, that's not even true for biologists anymore. That was Richard Dawkins' idea 35 years ago, and they've kind of moved past it because they, they've seen that that's too reified of a metaphor. It's not selfish genes that make organisms. It's a larger holistic process of organization. And it's not just DNA that's handed to the next generation. It's everything that's inside the cell is given to the next generation. So there are epigenetic effects uh, and characteristics which are handed down to the next generations. So what we're learning... I'm sorry, I'm we're sorry. Can we stop some with your, your, with your mischaracterization of reality somewhere? I mean, you already got four of them in there. Okay, I mean, okay, combine Darwin with Mendel. Okay, problem solved. Um, you know, I mean, this playing Which games problem, and we, that, that, that the fact and the science doesn't point to evolution and natural selection, that there's something else in there, is just nonsense. As for epigenetics, there is nothing, there's no evidence of any epigenetic effect except for a defect being passed on. The only thing they can pass on is a, a piece of brokenness. You cannot pass on a favorable um, constituent. You can only pass on a negative constituent. So it's completely useless. It's negative evolution. It's not positive evolution. Well, I can't think of a specific example to contradict that, but I, I don't think that's true. But if you're going to stick to your genetic uh, theory of, of random mutation and natural selection, almost 99.99% of mutations are going to be detrimental to the organism. So if you're going to explain all of evolution based on random genetic mutation, I think you've got your work cut out for you. All right, for many, four billion years and zillions of organisms reproducing. No, well, of course, and the favorable ones, one that. will be passed on. I mean, obviously, the bad ones will be eradicated rather quickly. Cool. So that, that's not the, the, the equation. And like I say, good, bad doesn't even have a decent definition anyway. Good, bad means surviving. Good, bad means great white shark. Make them another 100 pounds heavier. Make his teeth another foot longer. I mean, you know... The standard evolution cares about is is silly. I mean, from from an intelligent point of view, all it cares about is the successful reproductivity of the organism in their niche in the biosphere. It doesn't, like I said, it cares more about the copies than it cares about the things being copied. Gary, is it um, according to your your view is sympathy and empathy is it necessary for an intelligent organism to evolve? to have access to these qualities, um, not only down the individual, but the, the macro too, the collective of individuals. Well, will... look, well, look at, at, at the core, our sympathy and empathy are, are psychology. Again, it's a na naturally imposed um, disposition that has value. It had value to keep families together, and it, it kept the clan together, just like a wolf pack probably has to have those mechanisms. Um, we, with intelligence, can expand our, our capacity to have compassion and to care um, tremendously because we can imagine other people in our circumstance, we can imagine being in their circumstance, so we can take empathy and compassion and sympathy and make it really mean something because we can intellectually discipline it. But if we don't use our intelligence, it just becomes racism, nationalism, possession, um, you know, name name the. It just becomes a prejudice um, preference tool that's 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 possessed in that narrow um, um, vision. And so it's all about the intelligence. You've got to know that other people are your equal. You've got to know that their consciousness is just as valuable as your consciousness. There's no reason to harm anyone. Okay, not just you. Right. 
But I mean, it sounds like you're saying that intelligence is is really the root of empathy, and you know, I would say that you can be extremely intelligent and have absolutely no empathy at all. So they're not necessarily related. Well, you have to name me that extremely intelligent person. If you're going by IQ test scores, okay, fine. But to me, you cannot be extremely intelligent if you do not understand that another person's welfare is just as valuable as your welfare. That is not an intelligent statement. If somebody believes they're better than somebody else, that they're, what they feel is more important than what somebody else feels, yeah. they're an idiot. Well, they're not intelligent. Intelligence, though, is about logic and true and false, right? And and we're, you know, I think caring you about others is, is about value and, and morality, and they seem to be distinct. They, yeah. they overlap, but they're not equate equal. Yeah, I think we need to actually at this point. Well, in my opinion, there are they, 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 they are equal. You you develop the best morality and ethics through your intelligence, not through your subjective prejudice psychology. I think at this my point psychology we need to, uh, says my mother's better than yours. Do you believe it? I don't think you would concede that point, would you? My psychology screams it loud and clear to me. My mother cooks better than you. She looks better than you. She dances better than you. All right? That's my psychology says. My intelligence knows better. Okay, I see, I see your difference, uh, your differentiation there. Um, in terms of the intelligence issue, we could, we could have a, like a pragmatic way of solving it, just acknowledging multiple lines of intelligence, cognitive, emotional, mathematical, these kinds of things, and I think that just complexifies the issue, but human beings are complex things. Some are really simple, but some are very complex. And acknowledging that there's multiple lines of intelligence, I think is, is the right way to go here. Yeah, because, I, you know... I yeah, but you want to make it complex, though. That's the point. You want it to be complex. No, that's the I'm saying Humans exactly the opposite. The truth is obvious. It's goddamn simple. We have a psychology that's conditioned. It's a simple we have idea that's like that, Gary. That can do something entirely different. It's simple. It's not complex. It's simple. No, I think when you say simple, I think that's a cop out. It's just like, oh, it's too simple. That's I figured it out. Game over. But I think it's actually when you reflect on it, it's actually a lot more complex than uh, you give it credit for. You really have to pay attention to it. No, there's no, there's no. It's not hard to make a distinction between conditioned psychology and logically well-substantiated um, rationality. I mean, knowledgeable, rational sure, thought. Sure, there's, there's probably a spectrum, but... And you can see the, the opposites really glaringly, like black and white, night and day, but it's, it's when you get into the, this middle end of the spectrum when things are kind of gray, that's when things become complex. So it's simple, yet it's complex. Simple on the ends of the spectrum, complex as it gets towards the middle, is what, is what I'm saying. Well, I'm just saying it's, it's pretty obvious that we can draw the basic conclusions about our life that are they're very obvious, okay? Suffering sucks. Other people are equal to you. Uh, we can go down the list of the, the ten most important facts, and they're not really hard to ascertain facts. I, I sh sure, on the, on the important facts, I think we probably all agree that those ones are pretty... It would seem obvious, right? Suffering does matter, these things. And, yeah, so if you want to make a top ten list, then we'll probably subscribe to that one. Yeah. No, I think it's kind of silly. This, I mean, some are arguing against you. I think nicotine too, and uh, Jasper Avi are arguing that subject or that uh, suffering is merely subjective and doesn't matter objectively. And it's it's sort of I, I'm equally frustrated with it uh, as you are, Gary, because just these maybe for different reasons, but just these words subjective and objective are so overplayed and overdefined and. From my perspective, they both require one another. So to say su to say suffering is merely subjective is to forget that every subject is uh, vulnerable to suffering. So in that sense, it is objective because there's no subjectivity that doesn't, in some way, uh, or isn't capable of suffering in some way. So you know maybe you could uh, you could uh, respond to to those who would disagree with you that um, suffering matters. Objectively, you could say, but just I would, I would maybe it's better if we say suffering matters ultimately, just to avoid that whole subjective objective nonsense. Yeah, well, I look, I like looking at a subjective object as more of a perspective. I mean, an objective perspective would be one unbiased perspective, an unpolluted perspective, the most broad, um, encompassing of knowledge perspective. And so, I'm just saying, from that perspective. 
the brute value in the universe is suffering. There's nothing else. Everything else has value because it can harm something, because there's something vulnerable to be affected by an action. If there isn't something vulnerable that's going to be affected, and only going to affect a rock, then no one could possibly care. Who cares what happens to a rock? There's no, there's no possible way to build a rational argument that it matters whether the rock falls or the rock doesn't fall unless it's going to fall on something sentient. So if it's not going to affect a sentient creature, it doesn't matter. Well, there but is anything that does affect one will matter. And that's no, I mean, there'd be no way, there'd be no point in even taking another breath if you, if you declare nothing of value in the universe. That is just, um, to deny, the, the, like I said, it's just so obvious, but if you're going to deny it, then you might as well all be sociopaths because there's no reason to care whether it's old man.